All right, so here's that, that uh, function I showed you right at the end of the last video. e to the negative x over 2 times the sine of x. So we know that this is exponential decay, as I've mentioned. Um, let's graph that function first. e to the negative x over 2. What made it decay? Again, the negative makes that decay. Let's not use black. Let's use a nice color here. Let's go red. Okay. And let's graph the sine of x. All right. So what's going to happen here? Well, you know what? Let's let's. I'm going to just adjust here on the fly. Let's let's stretch this out here a little bit more. There we go. All right. So what's going to happen with this? Well, we have uh, we're multiplying, so we're going to take ten times zero, which would be zero. Okay. Now right here the sine function is equal to 1. So 1 times whatever that y value is going to be that y value. It's going to be up there. Now we're back to 0. Down here we have negative 1 on the sine function times whatever this value is on the red function, which is just going to be the opposite of that, which is going to bring it down. So we're going to see, similar to when we had x times the cosine of x, Something kind of neat happen here. Let's change that. Let's make it green. There we go. So we can see that our function, let's just zoom out here a little bit. Our function in, in the green is keep it's heading up and hitting our exponential decay, going back down to zero, going negative, coming back up and hitting it again, and oscillating in that sort of manner. Um, if I were to put the opposite of this function, let me just copy, paste, and put that negative, and let's also make that red, it's bounding those oscillations, which is pretty neat. And what I really should have done is instead of making this 10, Flatten that back out. Oh, that still needs to be negative, though. There we go. Maybe we can see a little bit better. I'm going to keep playing around with this, trying to make it as easy to see as we can. Um, let's slow this down even more. There we go. And let's get rid of that. There we go. Now it's a little bit easier to see how it's oscillating between these two bounds of that function that we're multiplying by to begin with. Get this really cool type of graph. Now our function is oscillating, going up and down. We've looked at spring problems before, but we call this damped oscillation because instead of just continuing to oscillate between the maximum and minimum, which are always staying the same, it's being damped. And you think about like damping a sound. Um, like if I hit a drum, it'd be going boom, and then I put my hand on it, and it would just slowly bring that volume down and slow that down. Come on, lights. Um, that's what we're having in here. This is called damped oscillation. Okay? It's what happens when you take something and you actually put it in the real world. So we've taken spring problems where they've just been going up and down. Well, in reality, we have air resistance, we have friction, those type of things, and that spring action is not just going to continue to go up and down. Uh, I'm going to switch to a YouTube video here to play for you guys that's going to uh, talk a little bit more about this damped oscillation. All right, here we go. Loss of energy in an oscillator is called damping. In this video, we will be specifically focusing on damping in a spring and mass system. Damping can occur within the spring due to energy loss from internal stress and as a result of external drag from air or water. The damping in an oscillator can be described in four ways. Undamped, 
underdamped, critically damped, and overdamped. In order to analyze these categories, we can use the experimental values beta and omega. Omega, the angular frequency, is equal to 2 pi over the oscillatory period. 2 beta is equal to b over m, where b is the decay constant and m is the mass of the system. The decay constant is found by fitting the peaks of oscillation to an exponential curve. If beta is zero, the system is undamped. Perfect undamped motion is impossible to achieve with a spring and mass system in the real world. Over a short period of time, however, the decay from air friction is negligible enough that a spring in mass in air can be representative of an undamped oscillator. If beta is less than omega, the system is underdamped. In an underdamped system, the amplitude of each oscillation gradually decreases until the amplitude reaches zero. If beta is greater than omega, the system is overdamped. In overdamped systems, the system returns to equilibrium without ever oscillating. If beta is equal to omega, the system is critically damped. For critically damped systems, the system returns to equilibrium without oscillating as quickly as possible. This is similar to overdamped oscillatory motion, but it returns to equilibrium more swiftly. All right, so there was some some uh, more information there, some good examples of what that damped oscillation can look like. Talked about underdamped, overdamped, critically damped, and so on. Um, so I think that's set up enough. We're gonna uh, go to the, one more video here where I'm gonna look at two different examples of uh, a damped oscillation problem.